That's right, I just put another Cronenberg film in the F tier. It's a bloodbath. <laughs> David Cronenberg is considered one of the best and most revered Canadian directors of all time. And with his new film, Crimes of the Future, about to debut at Cannes, I thought it would be only fitting to put all of his other films into a tier list. Obviously, this list won't include the new Crimes of the Future, but you can find that down below in a pinned comment once I actually see it. I will be going through this from lowest to highest average viewer rating on Letterboxd. And if you'd like to follow me on Letterboxd, you should, because we have fun over there, and I bet you will too. So let's kick things off with the first Crimes of the Future, which is in no way related to the new Crimes of the Future. This was a 1970s student film, the second student film that Cronenberg released that was feature length. And to be totally honest with you cinephiles, I didn't like it. I didn't like it one good gosh darn bit. Language! I'm going to better be able to explain my feelings about it when I get to talking about Stereo, which is the next film I'll be talking about. So for now, I'll just say that all of the charm that is in Stereo is absent from Crimes of the Future. And as such, I'm just gonna have to give it an F. Do not watch unless you are the most die-hardiest of Cronenberg fans. So now let's get into Stereo. David Cronenberg's first feature-length film, it is a student film from 1969, and this one is a big improvement over Crimes of the Future. The first thing that I would like to ask David Cronenberg if I ever had the chance to talk to him in person is how did you afford a helicopter for the very first shot in this film? It's a student film. Were you just trying to flex on all of your classmates? But really the charm of this film comes from the fact that it's structured as an educational film. And it really reminded me of a lot of the different kind of films that I would watch in my early elementary school days that were produced by the National Film Board of Canada or the NFB. And by using that educational film structure and applying it to a science fiction film about the government trying to give people telekinetic powers, the film was able to scratch a couple of different itches of mine, nostalgia and science fiction. It's great. It's shot in black and white and has some pretty cool interior shot thanks to shooting in what I believe was the brand new building of the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. It was back around that time in cinema when you could just shoot new buildings and pretend that they were from the future. It was kind of fun. Jean-Luc Godard did that in Alphaville. Also a good film to check out. But not what we're talking about today because I must put stereo on the tier list and because it is a definite step up from Crimes of the Future, but not really a fun film to watch, more of just like a nice curiosity, I'm going to throw it in the D tier. Next film on the list is Fast Company and Cinephiles. This is the least Cronenberg film to ever Cronenberg. There's no body horror, there's no existential dread, there's no ruminations on the nature of perception. It's just a movie about people driving fast and getting screwed over by their manager. It's actually the exact opposite kind of film that you would ever expect David Cronenberg to make, but he is a fan of cars, and that is something that we're probably gonna talk about a bit more when we get to Crash. So while watching Fast Company, I can appreciate that he perhaps wanted to do something a little bit different and get away from the body horror that he was becoming known for. This one just feels off and weird and strange, still decently enough made, and I think that you would have a fun time watching it if you were to watch it, but compared to everything else that's in Cronenberg's filmography, it's just kind of something you have to shrug your shoulders at, and for that reason, I'm putting it in the D tier. Next up is Cosmopolis, the 2012 film starring Robert Pattinson that desperately confused so many of his fans when it was released. Remember, Cosmopolis came out in the same year as the fourth and final Twilight film. So thank you, David Cronenberg and the casting directors of this film. You did a good job. Overall, Cosmopolis has always been a bit of a weird point in Cronenberg's filmography for me, mostly because they try to do the whole making Toronto be New York thing, but they just don't care at all about making Toronto look like New York. I think even they try to show you like Grand Central Station, but it's just Union. Beyond that, this film is not as action heavy as the trailer would lead you to believe. And really it just seems like David Cronenberg is trying to give you all of his opinions about everything, especially in terms of capitalism. I must give this film some props because it did offer us a brief glimpse into what would be coming next from Robert Pattinson as he continued and progressed throughout his career, leading all the way to playing the Batman. But Cosmopolis is a film that I would never revisit and I didn't have a lot of fun watching it the first time, so I'm gonna have to put it in the D tier. You can see the letterbox and I tend to agree on things for now. Next up is A Dangerous Method, which stars Viggo Mortensen, Michael Fassbender, and Keira Knightley. And this is a film that I remember being very excited for when it was coming to theaters. A lot of things were just coming together and culminating into this film, and you thought that it was going to be something special, and then it kind of wasn't. It was obviously a topic of interest that fascinated Cronenberg because it so deftly showed how Freudian thought gave way to Jungian thought and how psychoanalysis just became what we know it today. But it's also a David Cronenberg film, so you know it's gotta be horny, and oh boy was it. It's not his horniest film though, that's still to come. So for bringing in a great cast and for allowing Cronenberg to stretch his psychoanalytic legs, I'm gonna give A Dangerous Method a C. Next up is Map to the Stars, Cronenberg's 2014 film that starred Robert Pattinson, John Cusack, Julianne Moore, among others, 
And you know what, cinephiles? I'm not gonna mince words on this one. I hate this movie. I saw this film once in theaters and it did absolutely nothing for me. Part of my resentment for this film goes back to the ending of the film where there's like fire involved and it's CGI fire and it just looks bad. It just looks so bad. I hate that CGI fire. This is another Cronenberg film that doesn't really rely on body horror, but instead focuses in on how the Hollywood elite live their lives and does take a critical shot at them. However, narratively, I can only really remember this film being directionless and aimless, and I didn't really care about anything, and I didn't really care about any of the characters, and the story was kind of bad. Like, I just don't remember having good feelings about this film, and I have never once felt the urge to go back and rewatch it. And so for that very reason, I'm putting it in the F tier. That's right, I just put another Cronenberg film in the F tier. It's a bloodbath. Speaking of bloodbaths, Rabid, the David Cronenberg film from 1977 and his second commercial feature film, if I'm remembering things correctly. I already talked about Rabbit in my April 2022 tier list video, so please go check that out for my full thoughts. But I will just let you know that I appreciate how much this film was a step forward for Cronenberg after Shivers, and I really liked it for that reason, so I'm gonna put it in the B tier. Hey, speaking of Shivers, it's Shivers, Cronenberg's first commercial feature film from 1975. And this film, really set the template for what Cronenberg would do over the next 10 years or so in his career. Body horror stuff, gross stuff, people screaming, people running away from stuff. It all started with shivers. And yes, this film does feel amateurish at times, but I can kind of forgive that because it was the man's first film and he was making a schlocky horror film. So there is a tad bit of forgiveness we can add in here. However, I don't think shivers is on the same level as Rabbit, so I'm gonna have to knock it down to the C tier. Yeah, that seems fair to me. Now we move on to Spider, which was released in 2002. And if I had to bet, I would say this is the one David Cronenberg feature that has been seen the least by anybody. It stars Ray Fiennes and he gives a very good performance in it, but for whatever reason, it just never really caught on commercially. I think it may be one like best Canadian feature at the TIFF Awards, but that's not really going to matter for getting people to actually watch it because, spoiler warning, people don't like Canadian films because they're idiots. Spider, like other Cronenberg films from this period in his career, doesn't feature a lot of body horror, but there is a very heavy aspect of psychological horror in this. The viewer is left to detangle a spider web of lies and deceptions. And there's even a little bit of aesthetic carryover from his 90s films like Naked Lunch and Existence, and that everything has a kind of decaying feel to it. Nothing feels clean. So while I enjoyed the aesthetic of this film and Ray Fiennes had a very good performance, I largely think this is a forgettable film, and so I'm going to plop it into the C tier. Next up is M. Butterfly from 1993, and this was absolutely the film where David Cronenberg said to the world, hey, guess what? I can do things other than mentally scar you. M. Butterfly is a romantic drama espionage film that still plays with a lot of the themes that Cronenberg is into, namely identity and body politics. The film features two outstanding performances from Jeremy Irons and John Lone, and it really gets into how Western imperialism can lead us to project our fetishes and our fantasies onto the other. It also shows what happens when the subject of that projection turns out to be something that it is not, and it underlines just how much imperialist thought is wish fulfillment. Overall, this film really surprised me. I didn't know anything about it before I watched it, and I was kind of stunned that Cronenberg was able to make a film like this. It's only gonna get a B tier for me, but let me tell you, that is a very strong B tier. And if anything, that should just tell you how strong some of the films coming up actually are. But before we get to the heavy hitters, we have a few more of Cronenberg's earlier career to get through, including Scanners, the 1981 film starring Michael Ironside. And Cinephiles, I'll be honest with you, I have only seen this film once and it has been a little while since I've seen it, and mostly because of pop culture and things like Wayne's World. You ever see that scene in Scanners when that dude's head blew up? One of the main important things, and one of the only things I can really remember from the film, is that scene where the guy's head blows up. In fact, that is the entire trailer. If editing TJ is showing you the entire trailer right now, just know that this is how the film was marketed to audiences. It was literally a dude's head exploding. Oh my god, what has happened to this style of trailers? Can we please bring it back? I personally am a fan of Michael Ironside, and I remember liking him in this film, but there were just aspects of the film that didn't really work for me, didn't seem particularly well thought out, and when you put it up against films like Videodrome, which came out in a very similar time period for Cronenberg, you kind of look at one and kind of look at the other and say, this was not a fully formed idea, or something about this just didn't work the way that it probably should have. I think that Scanners is actually a bit of a forgettable film, as is clearly stated from my ramblings about it right now, so I'm gonna have to put it into the C tier, but I'm also willing to go back and change this, so please make sure to check the pinned comments to see if I change any of my opinions about these films. Next up is one that I'm a bit more confident about, and that is Existence, because I just watched this film for the very first time about 
a week ago. And I like how this film tries to hit on a lot of the same themes of Videodrome, but instead of looking at it in terms of broadcast media and videotapes and inserting ideas into people's minds, it's more looking at the nature of virtual reality and how it becomes difficult to determine what is real and what is not real if you get further and further into virtual reality. It was asking a lot of the same questions that Inception was asking, but like 10 years beforehand and with, I'm assuming, a tenth of the budget. Existence also definitely feels like a Cronenberg film. There is a lot of horniness in this. It's still not his horniest film, but it definitely is a horny film and there's a lot of body horror stuff going on with it. I mean they make a gun out of bones and the bullets are teeth. If that is not quintessential David Cronenberg, I don't know what is. Overall though, this is another film that I'm gonna have to throw into the C tier because it really does just feel like a bargain basement version of Videodrome. Everything he did in Existence, he did better in Videodrome and so because of that, yeah. It's a C tier. Next up is The Dead Zone, the Christopher Walken film from 1983, and it is based off of a Stephen King novel of the exact same name. And this is another one that it's been a little while since I've seen, but I have essentially the same type of thoughts about it as Scanners. It's good, it's not great, I enjoyed watching it at the time, but there isn't any aspect of the film that I found super memorable. I did rewatch the trailer before recording this, and I remember that Martin Sheen is in it, and I love Martin Sheen, so maybe this film actually deserves a B, but for now, I'm gonna throw it in the C tier with the possibility of once again bumping it up. And I imagine there's a lot of you yelling at your computers right now, so why don't you get into the comments and tell me where you would put these films that I'm putting in the C tier? Is that where you would rate them? I'm specifically interested about Scanners and The Dead Zone, because those could be B tier movies, but to me, right now, I'm saying C. The the last Cronenberg film that we're going to talk about before we get to the creme de la creme of this list is The Brood, a 1979 film that came out the exact same year that Cronenberg released Fast Company. This is a horror film that definitely has the family dynamic squarely in its crosshairs because it mostly features killer children. And if that's not terrifying to you, I'm willing to bet that you have never had a five-year-old come up and kick you in the shin. This is another 1970s Cronenberg film where you feel like he's just starting to get his legs as a filmmaker, but he hasn't quite got there yet. And if I'm remembering it correctly, it does feel like a bit of a step back from Rabid. I think the scope of it was actually a lot smaller, which was beneficial to it, but it just didn't seem as well constructed as Rabid tended to. So because of that, I'm gonna have to say C tier for Brood, although I feel like this is another one that could change with a rewatch. You know, it just occurred to me that I haven't put any of these Cronenberg films into the A tier yet, and maybe that's going to change with the 1996 film Crash. No, not that Crash, David Cronenberg's Crash. The film that was so horny and so sexy that when it debuted at Cannes in 1996, it was labeled pornographic. Wow. And Crash to me is peak 90s Cronenberg. He had just come off the success of M. Butterfly, but he hadn't yet moved on to the technological critiques of existence yet, so he was still interested in the body, its relationship to the erotic, and how car crashes played into both of those things. I've teased it a little bit already, but yes, Crash is the 100% most horny film that Cronenberg ever made. It also features great performances from the likes of James Spader and Holly Hunter. It has some fun Toronto cameos like The Gardener Expressway. And the only thing else that I can really say about this film is that it's stunning. It's just stunning. The film is so audacious. And if you know me and you've been following me for a while, you know that I have a thing for audacious films. This one is that. Crash is audacious. It goes in the A tier. And if you need a horny date night movie, it's Crash. It's gotta be Crash. But this Crash, not the other Crash, don't make that mistake. Next up is the 1991 film Naked Lunch. And to me, this film really is a bookend to Cronenberg's 80s period. We're talking about films like The Fly and Dead Ringers and Videodrome coming one after the other, and then we get to Naked Lunch. It does have specific elements in it that relate to Cronenberg's 90 output, particularly the decay and how everything just looks kind of dirty and unclean in Cronenberg films from this point moving forward. But it's also not shy about leaning into the 80s gross-out horror that made Cronenberg famous. It also has the distinction of being adapted from the William S. Burroughs book that everyone thought was unfilmable and was a big controversial book release when it came out in the 1950s in America. To me, Naked Lunch is a film that really gets by on its practical special effects and its overall aesthetic. The story is, from what I recall, confusing, but 
it's confusing in a fun way because when things start happening and you don't really know what's going on, there's also something awesome going on on screen. And so you're thinking to yourself, I don't know what's happening, but this looks really cool. So I'm all about this. Because my small, tiny brain wasn't really able to get into the story of the film, but the aesthetic quality was so high and the practical effects were so good, Naked Lunch is going into the B tier. Next up is A History of Violence, the Viggo Mortensen and Maria Bello film that I didn't even know was a Cronenberg film until I literally picked up the DVD in a Sunrise Records in London, Ontario, and looked at the very fine print at the bottom of it, and it said directed by David Cronenberg. A History of Violence is probably one of Cronenberg's most well-known films, so I'm not going to get too much into the plot, but I will say that overall, the performances here are really, really good. Viggo Mortensen is excellent. Maria Bello is excellent. William Hurt was nominated for an Oscar for this dang thing. The writing was spot on. And for a lot of people who are outside of the Cronenberg fan sphere, I think they would point to this film and say this is his best film. And it's kind of hard to make an argument for that, except for the fact that it is very easy to make an argument that it is not, which is something we're going to get into a couple of films from now. But for now, I will say that History of Violence is certainly one of his best. And I think it's a film that best marries his 1990s films from his 1980s films, although the amount of influence that the 1980s films have on History of Violence is quite minimal. I'm really just talking about that time that Viggo Mortensen used a shotgun in this film. It's gross. All that said, History of Violence, great film, going into the A tier, for sure. And now, cinephiles, it's time for Dead Ringers, one of the films that I have often said is one of the best Canadian films of all time. It stars Jeremy Irons, where he gives a, in my opinion, career best performance. And it's so good. It's so good. I probably should have written down actual notes about how much I love this film and how good that I think it is, because now that I'm talking to you into this camera, the only things, the only words that are coming out of my mouth are just heaps of praise without any backup for it. And maybe that's because this film just transcends description in my mind at this point. When I look at Jeremy Irons' performance, when I look at the aesthetic of the film, when I look at those creepy tools that Jeremy Irons' character uses and creates that always give me the heebie-jeebies and I have nightmares about constantly, I just think, God damn, this is such a good film. You also get David Cronenberg playing with the idea of identity by having Jeremy Irons play twin brothers and their surgeons, so they get to do weird David Cronenberg type stuff, although not to the point of, say, Videodrome or Scanners or Rabid, but from a more medical, from a more sterile point of view almost. It's weird to think about, but I think with Dead Ringers, we start to see what a David Cronenberg film would look like when he kind of tones it down. And since this film came out in 1988, he's not that far away from doing M. Butterfly and Crash. Now he did do Naked Lunch in between Dead Ringers and those other films, but I think it's Dead Ringers where we really start to see his calm and quiet style start to creep into his work. I wish I could say more about this film, but I am just incapable of doing that right now. So I'm just gonna say this film is S tier. I think it is one of the all-time greatest films that has ever been produced. If you were to make a list of the 250 or 500 best films of all time, this film is on it. 100%, not a single shadow of a doubt in my mind. It is one of the best Canadian films ever, and it is simply one of the best films ever. But it's also not the last David Cronenberg film to talk about, because now we're going to look at Eastern Promises, the follow-up to A History of Violence. And while these films are not really connected in any narrative way, there is definitely a thematic through line with both of them. They both center on the mob, they both star Viggo Mortensen, he's awesome in both of them, that's really not a theme, but you know what I'm talking about. One of the things that always stood out about this film, aside from the shower fight scene, was just how much preparation, how much work Viggo Mortensen put into playing this character. Getting to the point where he was like wearing his tattoos into Russian bars and speaking Russian with presumably Russian gangsters just to like see how good he was at playing the role, like good for him, that's ballsy. I wouldn't do that, but I'm not Viggo Mortensen. Overall, this is another one of those films that Cronenberg just knocks out of the park, but it's not one that I would put in the category of one of the best films of all time, which is what it really takes to get into the S tier. I'm always happy for David Cronenberg to go back and get into this like mob gangster type mode because I think he did some of his best work on A History of Violence and Eastern Promises, but it's not quite on the level of Dead Ringers and maybe one other film that we're about to talk about. So for Eastern Promises, I'm putting it in the A tier. Next up is Videodrome, the 1983 film where David Cronenberg firmly cemented himself as not only the king of Canadian horror, 
but the king of Canadian cinema. Videodrome strikes a near perfect balance of the main tenets of Cronenberg's work that I've been talking about in this video. It's horny, it deals with psychoanalytics, it's gross, and by the end of the film, you're not really sure about the fabric of your own reality. Long live the new flesh. Videodrome is an all-timer for me, and yes, I consider it to be one of the very best films that has ever been made. So I'm gonna put this one right up into the S tier alongside of Dead Ringers. And that brings us to The Fly, the highest rated Cronenberg film on Letterboxd. And just like I said about Videodrome being a perfect balance of all of the tenants of David Cronenberg, The Fly is mostly in line with it. It's certainly a horny film. It's certainly a gross film, although it doesn't really get into the psychoanalytic side of it too much from what I remember and it doesn't leave me questioning my reality by the end. It does, however, feature the birth of a giant fucking maggot, so maybe it all just really comes down to taste. I think that Jeff Goldblum is really good in this film. I think that Gina Davis is really good in this film. I think that the practical effects in this film are some of the very best that you're ever going to see in a Cronenberg film, if not the entirety of cinema, seriously. They do some magic in this film. However, I don't think The Fly is one of the best films ever made, but it is still very good, which means it's not quite S tier material, but it is absolutely a proper fit for the A tier. If you'd like to see me put more movies into tier lists, then please check out this video right here. And if you like this video, please like it and subscribe to the channel. Why haven't you subscribed to the channel yet, Jimmy?